In Japan, people with disabilities have traditionally been looked upon as a source of shame. But in a country which is still largely inaccessible, they are now fighting to become full members of society. Hello and welcome to DNET, the Disability Network. I'm Joe Coughlin. And I'm Susan Pettit. Japan, like many countries, has a tradition of segregating people with disabilities, taking them out of the mainstream of society. We'll hear how people with disabilities who see themselves as invisible people in Japan are fighting for change. We'll also meet Rick Kinsman. He was a national trampoline champion before an accident in sport made him quadriplegic. But he's still an active figure in the trampolining business. A disabled comic book character named Crash will be hitting the newsstand soon. Later in the show, his creator will tell us where the idea came from. First, here's this week's roundup of disability news. Susan? Thanks, Joe. The Quebec Human Rights Commission has ruled that a child with multiple handicaps cannot be barred from regular school simply because he is not able to meet the same standards as other children. The ruling means that David Marcille, age 9 of Saint-Luc, Quebec, must be reintegrated into regular classes. The problem began three years ago when David, who is autistic, was placed into a special education class because of limited motor skills. When his parents protested, the school commission not only refused to reassign David, but billed the parents $20,000 for the services of a special education teacher. The school has also been ordered to pay compensation to the family of nearly $26,000. When disabled ratepayers in St. John's tried to attend public hearings on hydro rates, they found an all too familiar problem, and that sparked a protest. Two weeks ago, disabled activists jammed the Public Utilities Board lobby. They said these stairs were keeping some of them from attending the public hearings. When the board got the complaints, it laid on this stair climber to provide access to the hearings. The, but the disabled said that was no way to go to public hearings. Eric Norman heads the Consumer Organization of Disabled People. He says the climber is inconvenient and an insult to disabled people. It would be the same thing as if you came to a building which had no doors and no stairs, but had a second floor. Yes. And you, you said, look, I want to get to the second floor, I have a right to get to the second floor. And someone came back to you and said, okay, we're going to get a ladder truck from the fire department, <laughs> bring you up, you can go up the ladder and get in through a window, and when you're ready to come back, I'm going to take you. It's the same thing as that. The organization also wanted signing translation for the deaf and big print audio and braille translation for the visually impaired and blind. PUB chairman Reg Good says the board is renovating its headquarters to make it accessible, but unfortunately the building won't be ready until the new year. My own personal feeling that we would be better off to proceed as, as we're doing and make sure that it never happens again. The disabled did win a victory of sorts. They got to raise awareness of the issue of access. And they finally got to present a brief to the PUB last week in an accessible Salvation Army temple across the road from PUB headquarters. Researchers at the University of Saskatchewan have invented what they say is a better drug to treat Parkinson's disease. And as Mark Genuist reports, it's not a cure, but for some patients, it's new hope. Oh, God, it's a miracle again. Lucille Sorosky has had Parkinson's for several years. Sorosky is able to make pickles and work around the house because of drugs that help control the disease. But people build up immunity to those drugs, so new, stronger drugs are needed. She hopes a drug invented at the University of Saskatchewan will help her fight Parkinson's. And now this new drug, if it's coming in, and it's going to be better than Depinol, I'm, going to, I'm not going to shake anymore. I'm going to dance and be gay <laughs> and think it's wonderful. You know, test in any enzyme wow. and see how much activity, how it responds to those. Dr. Peter Yu discovered the new drug after years of research. The drug is not a cure, but it will do a better job of slowing down the deterioration of the muscles associated with the disease. He says the drug must still go through a lot of lab tests before it reaches the market in about five years. You and his assistants have more plans for this drug. They hope to use it to treat other brain diseases, such as Alzheimer's. Mark Genuist, CBC News, Saskatoon. There may be relief in sight for people who suffer from chronic pain. A new non-narcotic drug is being made available to doctors. 
It's said to be as effective as narcotic strength painkillers, but is non-addictive. Suzanne Ross is 24. She's a registered nurse. But four months ago, she found herself in a hospital bed rather than standing beside one. She's had 15 various operations over the last 10 years. I've been given um, morphine, Demerol, Tylenol 3s, straight down on the line to Tylenol 1s. Um, with every one of those drugs, I was uh, vomiting and nausea, um, retching, lightheadedness. The alternative is, is Toradol. This new drug is being touted as a pain reliever as effective as narcotics. But unlike narcotics such as codeine, Demerol and Percodan, its manufacturer claims it's not addictive. It was approved by Health and Welfare Canada 10 months ago and is just now becoming available to general practitioners. Dr. Otto Vedlinger is a neurologist who has prescribed the drug to one of his patients. He says it's worked without any addictive effect, but only time will tell for sure. One is always a bit worried about analgesics being addictive. I remember when Percodan first came out as a non-addictive uh, uh, analgesic, where we know how non-addictive it has turned out to be. And that's this week's roundup of disability news. Coming up next, living with a disability in Japan, a country in which attitudes are slow to change. People with disabilities have been hidden away by many societies, out of sight, out of mind. But recently, there have been changes in attitude worldwide. And Japan, which historically considered disabled people to be a source of shame, is one of the countries that is just starting to change. Our next story is about one person who is fighting to raise awareness. Wendy Hanamura reports from Fukushima. Could you lend me a hand? That's the request Junko Asaka must make almost every day as she faces the greatest physical obstacle to her independence, stairs. For Japan's disabled, there are also invisible barriers, discrimination in education, employment, and a tradition of keeping the disabled shut away. We are very much invisible people. I'm trying to use mass transit, transit as much as I can so people can see me and look at me and people can understand me. Junko was born with a bone condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. She says she suffered over 20 fractures, which put her in a home for handicapped children for three years. Denied entry to normal junior high school, Junko had to fight for an education with the non-disabled. In 1983, she won a scholarship to the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley, California, where for the first time, she says she felt truly free. Uh, US, U.S. changed my life very, very much. Uh, to be different, to be different is totally okay. To be different means totally to be yourself. Today at 35, Junko Asaka is fighting for the right to be a full participant in Japanese society, a society that's still largely inaccessible. Of the 1,000 stations in Tokyo, 24 have elevators. But that hasn't stopped Junko from going to see her clients, part of her job as a peer counselor for the disabled. One client, Yoshie Suzuki, has lived in a nursing home for the disabled for eight years. Her dream is to have her own apartment like Junko and eventually get married and have three children. Most of Japan's four million mentally and physically disabled live in government-funded facilities or are cared for at home. Sociologists say, historically, the disabled were considered a source of shame in Japan. So they were kept out of sight, segregated in special schools and trades. <laughs> Yoshia would like to leave the nursing home, but her family won't allow it. <laughs> In counseling, Junko helps her tackle other obstacles. Yoshie can't find adequate attendant care. And for 10 months, real estate agents have refused even to show her apartments. Go 
やややってみたい Residents of the disabled home run this organic food store, a place where they can work in mainstream society. By law, in private companies with more than 63 employees, 1.6% of the workforce must be disabled. Last year, nearly half the companies surveyed fell short of the quota. The Labor Ministry's Yukiko Sakamoto vows she will finally crack down on chronic violators. ことしはその In her tiny two-room apartment, Junko lives on her own, relying on city-funded home helpers who come twice a week to do heavy chores and government aid of about $1,500 per month. The disabled complain these services aren't available nationwide, so very few can live independently. Because yeah, it needs a lot of power, energy, believeness, relationship, attendance, Money, so many things mm, create thinking. <laughs> so. Creative thinking and a band of volunteers, including her boyfriend Tomo, have taken Junko to seminars around the world. But back in Japan, attitudes change slowly. Tomo has been seeing Junko for four and a half years, but he has yet to tell his parents she's disabled. My uh, family lives in countryside, and I think my parents would have a um, little bit resistance <laughs> to uh, their, their uh, son going out with uh, handicapped people. Junko makes her monthly trip home to see her sister and family. It's here in rural Fukushima that Junko fought her toughest battle, breaking free from her family's loving protection. My disability is not a sorry for or a pity thing. Uh, I think my disability is like a, like my black hair, like my big eye. It's a personal uniqueness. In Japan, the disabled are cared for. But Junko says they want the education, facilities, and services to care for themselves, to no longer be invisible people, but full members of society. Susan, many of the obstacles that confront people with disabilities are very similar worldwide. How true. Mm -hmm. Coming up next, an athlete is disabled by the sport he loves, but finds a way to stay involved. past, people who became severely disabled in the prime of life were often sent off to institutions. Returning to work was rarely an option. For people who did find a new job, it was not usually related to their previous career. Now that doesn't have to be the case. Shefali Sajani is back with us again this week with the story of someone who has stayed in touch with the work he enjoys most. Welcome, Shefali. Hello, Sue. Hello, Joe. Hi, Shefali. Earlier this week, I spoke with Rick Kinsman. He was Canada's top trampoline performer. For six years, he held the Canadian Championship. He retired undefeated to go on to show business. Kinsman and his girlfriend, Leslie Young, formed a trampoline act that specialized in acrobatics and comedy. They traveled throughout North America, and in 1978, they were performing their show in Las Vegas, Nevada. It was there that Kinsman's life as a performer came to an end. He had worked 14 days straight and was training two young trampoline artists. He was doing a low spin off the trampoline and came down hard on the back of his neck in the middle of the net. The blow dislocated his spinal cord. He's been quadriplegic ever since. 
kinsman, who is now 48 years of age, did not give up on the trampoline business after his accident. Mr. Kinsman, what went through your mind when you first realized that you would never be able to perform on the trampoline again? Uh, it was quite a shock, and, and I would have to say it, it took me a couple of years after to get really over it and used to the idea that, you know, that uh, this situation doesn't improve. So it was really, it took a couple of wheel, uh, years before I uh, really started adapting to the situation. You know, having been an athlete all my life, like for 23 years, I had performed on the trampoline, you know, so uh, it, it's, uh, I guess, facing that whole thing of having to change and do something else. And I had no other uh, previous skills and any kind of background in any other type of field. You know, it was quite a shock. And when you did, you decided to go back to the trampoline business. You know, a lot of my friends uh, found that hard to, to understand. Say, well, that, like you wrecked yourself on a trampoline. Uh, why would you go back into that uh, whole field, you know? Uh, and uh, the fact is I always loved doing that work, right? Performing on the trampoline and bouncing and flying on the trampoline. It was really always very exhilarating. I really enjoyed it. And after I got over that kind of hump, uh, I started going back to the uh, trampoline meets and watching the younger athletes compete. And, uh, you know, I got fired up about it again. And then uh, getting back into the show business part of it took me a little while uh, because I used to get work through other agencies or, you know, booking agents, that kind of thing. So uh, what occurred to me over a period of time was that I should be handling that part of the business, you know. So we, uh, my girlfriend and I, we uh, put together uh, a, a kind of a little business. We started feeling it out, trying to sell our own trampoline act. And uh, then it started to grow from there very gradually, because I had no experience in the booking industry. And uh, we, we um, got together a new act with a, a new partner for Leslie, and we just concentrated on booking that one act, you know, that f for about for two or three years. And uh, as, uh, then we finally formed Rebound Productions, and uh, just tried to stay within the realm of bouncing type uh, showbiz acts, you know, like acrobatic in nature, gymnastic. -y. But our mainstay was always the comedy trampoline act. Is it hard for you selling the act, being in a wheelchair? Uh, it's more difficult than if I wasn't in a wheelchair, mainly uh, in the area of making personal contacts. You know, getting to and from, covering distances and making personal contacts. And, and carrying a briefcase full of pictures or whatever, that kind of thing. Sometimes it's it's just more time consuming if you're in a wheelchair and you have to load yourself up into a vehicle. It takes three times as long as uh, for another person who has no disability. You can just hop in the car, zoom down, meet the person, and head back, and it's all over with. For me, it's a, it's a half a day, you know, to to accomplish that. So you learn to adapt in other ways. Like I, uh, you get masterful on the telephone. Oh yeah, what kind or of tricks? Tell me some of your tricks you. that you use on the phone. I don't know if there's any trick. It's just uh, confidence, being really confident on the phone. Uh, you know, it's it's being uh, enthusiastic, and uh, and I think you really have to believe in your product. I mean, that's what's really helped. Like staying with that comedy trampoline act for so many years is something I love doing. So it's easier to sell something that you really like. You know. Would, would you have advice for somebody who's getting into a business like this, somebody who has a wheelchair or some other kind of disability oh, yeah. who wants to break into showbiz, say? Okay. Um, it's always nice if you can, if you're going to get back into it, pick a field that is somewhat related to what you used to do. You know, then, uh, you know, then it's easier to make that transition. If you just jump into a total if different activity, I mean, you've got to learn a whole new set of skills. So. so try to pick something that was generally related to what you used to do. And, uh, and I guess for a lot of people, uh, I think once you get, o you know, get over the fact that you're in a wheelchair and you have to learn a different set of skills, uh, it's really not that difficult. Once you, get, you just have to get used to it. Rick Kinsman is not only managing acts that feature his girlfriend, Leslie Young, he is now starting to pursue other acts as well. And recently, he booked an entire variety show. Coming up next, a comic book character with a difference.
When you think of comics and superheroes, able-bodied characters come to mind. Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. Not only able-bodied, but super able-bodied. But a new character is about to join the ranks of the cartoon world. He sprang from the mind of a cartoonist from the state of Maine. For years, Mike Libby has drawn cartoon characters. But it wasn't until an accident involving chlorine gas left him with limited lung capacity and a lack of strength that he decided to draw characters with disabilities. It was after this that Libby, along with his partner Ben Kayford, decided to write a cartoon strip that integrated a disabled character. The creation was the Rock and Roll Minor Ants, a group of superhero insects, including Crash, a feisty wheelchair crusader. In an attempt to get the idea off the ground, Libby and Kayford took their idea to Kevin Eastman, creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Needless to say, Eastman was impressed with the idea. I guess the fact that they're all on roller skates is, is kind of different, and Crash, uh, the wheelchair is real aerodynamic. He's, um, he's a real daredevil of the group, the motivator, and gives it a lot of excitement, and it gives it a different, I think, a different twist. Um, there isn't anything really out there like that, and I think it can, you know, it's kind of a pioneer. Although the project is in the early stages, Libby says it is their hope that the minor ants will one day be seen on television screens everywhere. Our intention is for uh, cartoons because I, that's what will give the uh, crash and everybody on, on roller skates the real effect that we want to get across um, that will be a lot more better than a uh, comic book. The comic book you can do quite a bit with, but when you can actually see it happening on TV, you know, it will be a lot more exciting. So while television projects are something to look forward to, the first edition of the comic book has just been published. It should be on store shelves by the beginning of December. On last week's show, we looked at access to conferences and the hotels that host those conferences. One of our viewers wrote to us with some tips for hotel owners. Hotels should be commended for trying, but things are not as good as they seem. I would like to point out a few things. One, the hotel management has to stop assuming that the disabled traveler travels with someone else. I travel alone quite often. Two, most doors are too heavy to open. Three. Carpets are so heavily underpadded that one needs a tank to push through them. Four, please don't recommend that toilets be raised. Hotels should provide an attachment to raise the seat, quite inexpensive to buy. I was in a hotel in Ottawa which assured me they had a wheelchair accessible room. Their idea of accessibility was that I could fit through the bathroom door and there was a grab bar over the bathtub. However, in order to get into the tub, one would have to stand up, close the door which opened in, and then use the tub. The problem with hotels is the lack of uniformity and consistency. Speaking to the disabled is a good start, but let's remember that we all have different needs and by speaking to one disabled person does not cover the whole spectrum. And that letter was from Lena DiCarlo from Toronto. You can write to us with your comments, stories, or ideas. We'll give you our number in a moment. Remember, we're also watching our mail for photographs or videos depicting inaccessible pieces of architecture or examples of bad planning. The best entry of the week will receive a Dina t-shirt or cap. And that's our show. I'm Joe Coglin. And I'm Susan Pettit. See you again next week. Now here's our address. Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. Or you can fax us at area code 416-975-5636.